Sonina, we're freezing. We are freezing. <laughs> it's really cold. It's very early in the morning. It's really, really absolutely and, and windy. Yeah. And, uh, let's warm up and talk about the state of the politics. Yeah. By the looks of it, there's a bit of a rush going on in Brussels, right? It seems like. Um, oh, they're really speeding things up and yeah. or, or trying to get a better and, and uh, sustainable framework. Yes. It seems like for years we've been waiting for the e privacy regulation, if you remember, to update oh, e privacy, yeah. you know, the cookie banners. But and it was always, you know, like nothing really happened. It was just like changes and, and always in preparation, but never really came into, into a thing. Yeah. And it got stuck. Yeah. They say, and I believe that it's because of the lobbying. So many. I think so. Yeah. I think this is why before we had nothing, then we had GDPR with the cookie banners, yeah. or we still have. But also, I think this is not ideal, but this is what they came up with. And then, yeah, they also think it's because of lobbying. Yeah, it seems like it's, it is as if there's been a learning curve in, you know, in the industry. Mm. So you have the GDPR. It took many years, perhaps eight or ten years in the making. Hmm. Twenty-eight countries agreeing on a common framework. That's uh, heroic, yeah. you know, to say the least. Yeah. So after seeing the impact it had on the industry, you know, on big tech, on whoever can afford a proper lobby in Brussels, I'm not surprised that they could see whoever was going to be affected by e-privacy, which was going to touch the entire online advertising ecosystem, could feel that they need to push very hard yeah. to, you know, to ensure that it wasn't going to destroy a multi-billion business, multi-billion dollar or multi-billion euro business. Yes. And so I understand that e-privacy or that regulation, that update has got stuck because of the lobbying. And so it seems as if now in Brussels, the commission, particularly this commission, is in a bit of a rush to try and cut through the system and get things approved at the speed of light. Which we urgently need. Yeah. But what does it mean for the individual? What do we have? Will we have better protection and more information? I think this is what I often feel with the cookie banners, and it explains to you what a cookie is, but does that help me in any way where my data ends up? Not really, yeah. but does it, will there be steps taken to towards better education, more information on individual privacy? Well, when it comes to the individual, I guess there's also the question as to how far do we go hmm. making a decision on their behalf? So, in a way, we're saying, yes, we need to rush it because we've got, you know, we haven't been able to move um, with past ideas. But if we go too far on behalf of people, then we end up with a rushed, you know, pile of laws that are going to curtail what people can do as well. Yeah. So, is it really going to protect the individual? that we keep on thinking that, you know, that we need to do it all for them. Are we at risk of curtailing freedom by, you know, simply... That's an interesting question, yeah, but too many rules, rules uh, can, can ruin that and can, can make the people feel restricted and, uh, and not being able to exercise their rights. Uh, anymore but or having so many rights that you as an individual are, are burdened burdened with the rights yeah, yeah with all the things you need to sign I mean an, an example is again consent if you need to consent to everything because it is imposed on on the system that they need to get the paperwork in order and the paperwork means bothering you to sign yet another form how free I mean are you really free because you get to sign 10 more forms. So now, <laughs> picture yourself now in a, in a very near future, right? We're going to walk into a bank and you're going to sign an AI act form because they want to train their algorithm with whatever you're you know, giving them. 
they're going to come up with another sheet of paper. I'm just, you know, sort of joking, but it could happen for yeah. the, uh, you know, for the DSA. Oh, you will agree to whatever else so that we can, you know, we can be protected, the, you know, since we are a, an aggregator or a, you know, a very large online platform as per the law. Then you could have another form, which is, you know, concerning the, the Data Act or data governance. Yeah. And then another form for the new e-privacy regulation if it sees the light. And then another one for the GDPR. So you sign up five forms. Are you... At least. Yeah, yeah. How free are you because you signed five forms? Not really, yeah. It takes, it takes then a lot of time and lots of bureaucracy. Um, shouldn't be the solution not at all but um but it, it's all already with the consent banners it's so annoying like you go on any website yeah. first you have to click uh you have to find the right button because uh, very often it's still <laughs> well hidden uh to reject cookies and uh then you have to but well, you're not really given the choice and then you have to click away newsletters and chatbots and whatever before you can get to the actual page and find that everything's behind a paywall. Uh, but <laughs> exactly. Um, so yes, yeah, so this is annoying and it's not very helpful and it also cuts away of your time. Um, but not having the cookie banners means data can be collected without your consent. If, yes. But in, in this also, is, despite the cookie banners, uh, it is yeah. being collected and. Um, okay, so that's a very good one. Consent. But then, so we need to, we need yeah. better solutions. And I don't think uh, law and, and regulation only will help us. But yeah. I think we just need, everybody needs to use their common sense yeah. to, to do better. And, and, and well, we need more ethics. Yeah, exactly. So the thing is, okay, so if the starting point is the law, the law is on the one hand, uh, giving you control, right? Mm. And this is what we do with consent. And again, as you say, we may not be getting what we wanted in terms of control. People are not really feeling control. They are feeling annoyed and bothered and they're agreeing to whatever is presented to them. Because as you say, no matter what you say, things are gonna happen anyway. So that part of the law is not really working that well. But then something else the framework is giving you, so again, before we land into the ethical side, right? The law is also uh, assuming that no matter what you consent to, you still need protection because you were, you may not, you know, fully understand, right? There'll be certain instances where a platform, just because it is very large, as it happens as per the DSA or the DMA, they simply cannot be allowed to, you know, to just ask you and keep going. So that's that's okay. We assume that people need protection, even protection from themselves, meaning from your own willingness to agree to things that will affect you, but you're unable to measure how much it will impact your future. Yeah. So again, the, the classical, you know, comparison with people willing to sell their, their kidneys because there's good money in it, right? So we won't let them do it. So then there's the ethical side, right? There's an ethical dimension underlying the law because the law has to be grounded on something yeah how do you get to the ethical dimension because if it's just uh, about your subjective sort of guardrails or your own limits your moral sort of red lines how does that see you know get through into the law what's your it feeling is, yeah um, an interesting question. Um, I think very often ethics is regarded as something individual and very vague and something and more of a, a feeling or an, or an intention than something really. And true, compared to the law, to strict and uh, regulations that are quite um, definite. <laughs> And specific, yeah. Um, when we're ethics or not, but um, I think in well, it differs from culture to culture, but it doesn't differ from person to person. Yeah. 
um, I think, for example, you and I would have very similar um, ethical standards um, when it comes to its general behavior. And this is what I also mean with common sense, for example. And, and if you take, like, say, for instance, you go out with friends for drinks and you are the one who didn't pay around for everyone you, you didn't buy a, a round of drinks for everyone is that illegal no is that morally questionable not really it's not the nicest thing in the world but it's not like come on it's your friend maybe you, you yeah. pay next time yeah whatever um but if you if you murder someone that's illegal <laughs> that's highly immoral too yeah. Um, if you cheat on your partner, highly moral but not illegal. Yeah. yeah. So this is the frame that we are moving in. Yeah. Between, but but this is why ethics are so important because um, even though cheating on your partner isn't illegal, it's still it puts you in a position that doesn't make you feel good. Well if you have a conscience but yeah um and, and yeah the way most of us grew up is like yeah it, it doesn't make you feel and and others specifically um makes them feel miserable and and you're being not regarded as a very trustworthy or reliable person yeah and we do we all want to be well the majority of us uh, I believe, yeah. want to be um, done in a good light, want to be seen as um, trustworthy and, and um, characters of high moral value. Yes. Okay, so this, right, so there's the ethical dimension of you in your own light, meaning that something that makes you feel that you conform to things that you find morally acceptable, right? So within your own personal dimension, dimension right? Mm -hmm. So as, as individuals, as human beings, there, there's things that we cannot accept, that we cannot do ourselves because we will not feel, you know, that we're respecting our own moral values. Even before... There are things that we don't want to do, that we don't want uh, to decide how what we won't ourselves yeah. want to be treated. Exactly. So there are certain things that even if no one is watching, you just cannot do because it breaks your internal laws. There's that. As you keep expanding that, then you, you know, reach out to the group, uh, society. And there's things that you know you won't do because others will find them objectionable, right? Hopefully that's aligned with what you think as well. As you keep expanding, then you find different groups and different interests and that's what happens when the law is made right when you um agree on a legal framework there's all of these interests sitting at the table yeah and then you've got people that have their own you know sort of moral duties and then how they are matching those against their own interests and all of these interests and moral duties are fighting each other to conform to a law they can agree on. So I guess, you know, not, to go, not to go in circles with that one, with uh, ethics, but I'm thinking, because ethics is not, you know, a natural law, something that is written, it's not the no. same for everybody, right? No. If, in fact, as we can say, in different cultures, the things that we find acceptable are very different. We're freezing, are we? Definitely, yeah. <laughs> but no, but it's, it's kind of... I guess as we walk, we'll... Just, yeah. Yeah. So that's the pond. That's the pond. Yeah. Yes, it's so beautiful. There are several different ponds in Pesca, and some of them we can swim. Yes. Yeah, but not this one, right? What can you swim in that one? Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, this is the, the men's one, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. And the one next to us that we're getting on. Yes. Yeah. 
Um, no, but what I think we need, well, different cultures have different standards, different, yeah. different ethical, uh, unwritten rules, if you will, um, to, but, um, for example, the UK, Germany, and Spain, yeah. they're quite similar, or in, in Europe yes. in general. But in the US, to pick up uh, your remark from the beginning, I think in uh, when it comes to freedom, the definitions or the, the limitations uh, are a bit different. Yeah, I think for Americans, at least this is my perception, the freedom is of the utmost importance. Um, and this is how, well, if you look at the history, how the country grew, this is what is ingrained into every American that their freedom yep. Yep. cannot be cut. And, and, but this is, and this is often used and laid out in different yeah. cases. Um, I don't want to go into politics too much here, but um, yeah, and I think um, in, in Europe we have a different a notion of freedom yeah a, a little bit yes yeah. yeah i guess the fact that you know the, the u.s was made out of a revolution right and our people escaping the the very um framework that we had but you know the monarchies and whatever they escaped when the country was first formed right the fact that it's built on on an individual's ability to rebel against the monarchy, yeah. right, and against the rules, and then to make their own rules and to you and know to be find able to this vast country that is exactly almost uninhibited, or just a very few people exactly who who are so different from what you've known. So it makes for very different, a very different culture, and we're trying to come to terms with that, of course. Um, someone said recently that. The problem with England was that the uh, the revolution hadn't been uh, hadn't happened in the country; it had happened elsewhere because it happened in America, and so they were stuck. This was someone in America, of course, saying this. Oh, your problem is that you're stuck, you know, uh, with our revolution, which we we had it, we had it for you yeah. on your behalf. <laughs> you know, you never had it, so. Uh, um, but in the end, the reality is that we have this, this scenario. We've got um, all of these values that we've been inheriting for many years. And then we're trying to come to terms with, in this case, data transfers and different perspectives on what should be done with data. But perhaps I'm thinking to, to, to drive it somewhere more practical. So uh, let's think of, uh, of a way to drive it somewhere more practical, so we get some some good ideas. Um, but, but yeah, I think more practical means um, um, really we need to empower people, individuals, with more skills to to be to enable them to decide what data they want to share and in and, and what time. And, yeah. and there are already different ideas. The BBC is, um, for example, um, experimenting with parts yes. um, and data holes. Uh, yes. And not only the BBC, there are many different projects. And Tim Berners-Lee saw the project, one of them, uh, and many different companies working on that. Um, but then I think um, the question of, of data and the data that you want to give and that you don't want to share, um, I think what needs to be done. Oh, look, there's someone swimming. Yeah, that's where I swim. That's where Uncle swims. That's where you swim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Swim, yeah. Oh, wow. Now in this weather. Yeah. Not for me. <laughs> but very cool. Yeah. But I'm colder walking now than I am in, swimming there. Swimming? Yeah. Because once you in, oh. you, you get totally used to it, and then do you want to speed up a little? Yeah, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. just to warm up a bit. Because still have to talk. I, I sort of lost my temperature. Print here. 
yeah, yeah. But, but this is where yeah. we're, 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 we're standing on the yeah. hill for. No, we're good. We're yeah. good. Yeah. Um, no, but no, I think we need, what, what we could have to do. Yeah. Um, is to avoid this whole topic because it's so complicated. Yes, yes, and, yes. And to be a bit like not afraid is to maybe too strong, but to really try to avoid it because it's inconvenient and then you have to look really into what happens to your data. And this is yes, scary. Yes, yes. Because yes. it really is like yeah. uh, people who collect your data without your knowledge, who, um, who sell it to data brokers mm. and, and whatever happens. Um, but um, how can we make this not scary for people? How yeah. can we find ways? For example, I'm exaggerating a bit here, yeah. but shouldn't we, instead of telling what a technical cookie is and what it does technically, uh, write on those cookie banners, uh, I, do you accept to be tracked? Do you accept your data to be sold to third parties? Uh, do you accept us to send you information and keep you in our database and uh, invite others to use the database too to send you uh, adversity or whatever? This is what yeah. hap this is what's happening. Yeah. Shouldn't this be written on those banners? Yeah, no, that's no. This is never going to happen because yeah. of the lobbying, and this will destroy. It. Um, no, it's a good example. I mean, you know, that, you, that you're raising. So, you know, the example of the we could extrapolate from cookie banners what happens with everything, right? Mm. How do we inform people and let them and help people understand the risks and at the same time avoid scaring them? So that's a very hard balance. Thin line. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you have. As of today, the main issue we have with when it comes to data ethics is that, and this is a, a huge challenge, people, society, if you ask around, everybody will say they are concerned about their privacy. Mm. Of course, if you ask anyone on the street, are you concerned about your privacy? Oh, sure, my privacy is very important. You know, I was talking the other day um, to a friend and he said, why don't you just do that? Go on the street, make a report, not people on the street. Are you concerned about, or what do you know about cookie banners? And not very much. I don't think yeah. this, well, we will have to see, but I think that would be very interesting. But then go and ask them whether they would be willing to give up their Instagram account. Yes. And nobody, nobody would ever, you know, most people would say, well, I don't know what the challenges are. You can then tell them, look, there was a data leak, right? and Instagram account or, you know, email addresses per the latest sort of news and, and phone numbers were leaked, right? Uh, how do you feel about that? Oh, it's outrageous. Fine, what will you do about it? Well, nothing. I want my Instagram account. Yeah. So... Until it happens to you and then it's like, <laughs> oh my God, I never thought it would happen to me. Well, it's not only that, it's also the fact that it's very hard to understand the real impact of, of such data leak. Because today you may think, oh, it's just my phone number. Okay, it's a shame. Maybe someone will call me and bother me, but that's it. The problem is that understanding the real future implication of a data leak today takes a better view, a better understanding of the possibilities of data analysis, of AI, of future uses of this data. And how do you get people to understand it, right? Unless you start going very deep into speculating with, you know, what future actors may do. So it's not easy. No, it's not easy, but I think this is not only an EU digital strategy uh, responsibility yeah. for just the government yeah. policy makers responsibility it is on the one hand each of our own responsibility to try to protect our data better and then yeah. like i said before we need to be everybody in the individual needs to be enabled to do so and, for, and to do this the industry can really help can make things better 
not only because it's the right thing to do and not only because the industry consists of people who also want to have their privacy protected but because it is an actual advantage yeah because in e-commerce in retail how can you compete how can you set yourself apart from competitors yeah. i think you can do this through value through adding value to your products and services uh, you cannot compete in price. Um, giants like Amazon yeah. will always be yeah. cheaper and uh, will always offer a similar product. Yeah. Also, one will invent a similar product than you have just come out with um, yeah. or will follow shortly. Um, so, you cannot offer different products or, um, or a different price, a cheaper price. Yeah. But you can add value. And value doesn't mean only more sustainability, more transparency yeah. when it comes to supply chains and how you pay your workers and, yeah. uh, and showing environmental responsibility. You can also do this by offering higher data protection. Okay, that's a good point. That's a good one. So, there's like Hello. different... <laughs> there's beautiful dog. happy dogs around here. So, uh, and you know, the ladies pond is here. So you would go in that, you know, you can't see it, but it's right behind. Yeah, that's the ladies pond. Pretty exotic. Yeah, all surrounded by trees and bushes. Maybe when it's a little bit warmer. I've never done this. I'd probably get a heart attack. <laughs> you would love it. You would love it. So, uh, Yeah, I'm thinking that this, this, uh, all these different layers, right, to to ethics, to getting this to work. So, what do we want? Let me let's sort of uh, rethink, or let me sort of uh, regroup my thoughts to put it like that, yes. right? What do we Please. want? We want the world to be a better place. To be a better place. Okay, of course, like everybody. So, but we want to improve things when it comes to. Um, the way I see it, protecting freedom and protecting our, free, our future. I always think about freedom and how whatever data you expose today will eventually have an impact on your choices, on your ability to choose. Because that's, again, that will define whether you can get insurance, whether your children can access a university, precisely because of things that you are sharing today and you can't really see what's going to happen there's no way you can measure today what will happen tomorrow because you can't you know there's no way you can foresee who's going to be around the corner gathering all that data look at no. facial recognition data or whatever there was this anecdote that i heard pretty funny uh the uh the prime minister of australia took a picture of his uh boarding pass and I think he sent it on Twitter or Instagram or something saying, oh, I'm flying out. Oh. And the boarding pass had an ID, you know. The it's, QR code? Uh, well, perhaps underneath the QR code. I can't, I don't think they said that. I heard it in, a, in an AI podcast. And so um, apparently someone looked at the picture and took the reference number into the Qantas airline website and together with some additional basic information that everybody has because he's the prime minister the prime minister flies of Quentas? australia yeah yeah they don't they have like their own uh airplane you mean like a prime minister official airplane yeah well they have an australian and airline so i guess one yeah <laughs> perhaps we were showing off that he was using a public uh you know yeah, okay. civil civil uh, airline sorry i'll okay, go on <laughs> But anyway, um, so he went to the Qantas website and he could access the portal where you can modify your flight. You know, did, the did flight they? had already happened, so he couldn't, you know, mess with the prime minister's flight. But he could see all of his data about the prime minister that wasn't public. And he looked at the source code of that page and the Qantas website was sending this... Uh, chunk of data that was hiding in the source code as a JSON file call, call and that included plenty of information and it was in the source code 
So Qantas has a problem, <laughs> I would well, say. The thing is not just Qantas, is that there's a lot of people out there working with data. Mm. A developer wants to, wants the feature to work, right? For you to be able to change your flight, change your flight, whatever, edit your details, and they're hiding some of the information in there so it loads yeah. up faster as you want to, you know, edit your account or whatever. So it's an example. Who has a role to play here? And first we've got people, right? As individuals, we need to know that this is not a joke. So the first thing is, yes, we don't want to scare anybody, but in a way, there's no easier way to educate society than being scared because things like Cambridge Analytica see the light. At the same time, I'm not too happy with documentaries like, you know, The Great Hack, if that was the name, or uh, social, The Social the Dilemma. Social dilemma. Yeah. I think they're, they go a bit too far. They, they are portraying, for example, the social media or advertising industry in, a, in, in too bad a light. I you don't, know? yeah, I don't understand really what the point is. They want to expose, they say they want to expose it, but what they do is fear mongering, I think. And, and it's simplifying, oversimplifying. Any, yeah, oh, yeah, oversimplifying. And then when the vast or, or a lot of people do not have sufficient information what really happened, and then they see that movie and then it's like, or the <laughs> yeah. documentation and it's like, oh my God. And this is like, this creates more fear than it really helps to educate people. This yes. It's not helping at all. Exactly. And then so, and, and what's the consequence, right? Even if you thought, okay, well, maybe again, uh, perhaps there was no, I mean, ethics plays a role there too. Like when you build, when you do a documentary like that, are you being true to what you know and um, to your own values? Because, or are you going after the final goal, which is getting people scared so they, you know, <laughs> so they stop sharing their data in a, in a, you know, in a foolish way. But yeah, but then uh, was it this? What? This sometimes then feels to me like um, without sufficient information, yeah, what can I do? I cannot be on the internet then at all anymore when I'm being spied and tracked anyhow. So people go for either, oh, I give you everything. I accept, yeah, accept all the cookies because yeah. I don't have nothing to hide. Yeah. Versus I cannot use the internet at all anymore. Yeah. Um, either way is extreme and not really helpful yeah uh, because the internet and all these software technologies have so much to offer and, and so yeah. many beautiful developments and i'm not saying that connectivity the constant connectivity and the constant being able to reach anybody all the time is always helpful but yeah like you said to me before I arrived, when I asked you, like, can I bring you anything from Germany? And you said, well, this is something that I haven't been asked in a long time because because of globalization, because of the connectivity, so many yes. products and services are available out yes. there that were used uh, to be obtained locally only. Yeah. 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 But so, okay. So, and... Um, yeah, the internet has all these benefits. We want society, we want, as, you know, as, as a society, we've benefited. So, um, being able to exchange, you know, being able to exchange information about ourselves, being able to buy things, you know, abroad, it's been an advantage. And I guess, so, going back to how everything connects to the legal framework, right? We wanted to set basic rules to make sure that as we keep going, you know, as the world becomes smaller and you start buying from anywhere and you start, you know, as a business, being able to address consumers anywhere else, that, you know, we have basic rules that protect our future. Of course, the problem we found, and this is, I think, the essence of of where we are in terms of the data ethics challenge and the and the privacy challenge is that as oh, cool. the world yeah, becomes so smaller then our moral values do not coincide with those of other countries so i was picking up because look at the sky look yeah now it's beautiful now it's patched really yeah yeah really beautiful today yeah 
So, uh, you know, so of course, this is, this is the, the most interesting part to me is that we have our values as a society. You may have them in a country, even at European level. And you agree that there are certain things that we will not do with people's data. And uh, there are certain things that could happen, that we're all aware that could happen. So we'll make sure they won't by ensuring that data is only kept for a certain time, etc. Now, you go into the world and you're selling to the US and you're accessing US media or Chinese media or Japanese media, right? Or media from Indonesia. The values in these countries are not necessarily worse than anybody's, right? It's just a different set of values. So if your moral ground, if, you know, what you believe is right, uh, is being respected, you know, you, your practices respect what you believe is the right thing to do, then you're not really being unethical when it comes to your beliefs, right? No. But because there's no common grounds, then again, as you were saying earlier, how do we ensure that we can align everybody's principles when your beliefs are not being respected elsewhere, but yet you want to trade with that separate country? How do we do that? Good question. You tell <laughs> so, me. I don't know. <laughs> here uh, he, he comes terms, right? And all of these yeah. challenges we have these days. So we're saying, well, in the US, uh, you know, people will not understand this problem we have with a US government being able to, you know, access you know, like Facebook logs because they think, you know, that information is going to be doing much harm or because they think that that's a risk you need to take. You want to be protected by the state or whatever. And then it goes the other way around. Americans come over to Europe with their data and they think, why should I go through so many hurdles? Why do I need to accept all these silly questions, all these silly pop-ups in Europe? You know, they do nothing. No, an American <laughs> so, website, nothing. Yeah. They so, assume you accept everything. Yeah, so... I don't know. Yeah, um, what happens then to the data? It's European data. Impose the on all. So what rule applies? <laughs> well, the European GDPR huh. protection that is supposed to protect European citizens. Yeah. Or American protection because it's on American ground and then American law applies. Yeah. yeah. This is a, a dilemma. Um, yeah, I don't know what the solution for that will be, but I think this is something that will... Um, will be around for a little longer before there's any solution. Yeah. Um, so perhaps, you know, the ultimate answer will be that relying on moral values is very is shaky ground because they depend a lot on every society, every individual. And, you know, everybody's red line is constantly moving as you evolve, you know, as you, your red lines could be moving in, in any direction, right? I'm not saying that you become more tolerant or, that, or less ethical or less moral. I'm just thinking that everyone, you know, and every culture evolves in different directions. It's happening with, you know, with everything. So with like, you know, the environment. So if that's the case, then we need to be perhaps more practical and finding a way that protects people from the future we can envisage today. So by when it comes to, to basic data ethics, what I'm thinking is by making sure that we only, this is a thing, a pretty safe, you know, pretty safe sort of uh, rule. If we only collect the data we're going to need, right, that we know we need, for whatever we who defines what <laughs> data we need like if you look yeah. at uh, legitimate interest it's only in the interest yeah. of the business never in the interest of the individual yeah it, it should be both it could be both oh it's a balance it's also yeah yeah in the individual's interest yeah to find the products and services but from retail perspective yeah 
they want and to be able to search and filter and sort yeah. the, the results yeah. by what they need, what they are looking for. And also sometimes be stretched, not relying on only recommendations based on previous purchases. Like if I have a washing machine, I don't need another one. Yeah. Classic example. And I don't need to be shown another one. Yeah. Or if I buy a present for someone else. Uh, things that I'm personally not interested in at all, at all. I don't need to find this in my purchase history forever. Yeah. But sometimes, if I look at streaming services, for example, it would be interesting not to be um, recommended films and, and TV shows that I've been uh, watching and that are sort of similar. Maybe not yeah. sometimes, I think. It's, it's, it's just ridiculous. But um, to be shown something that I don't know about, to discover something new, something yeah. that I'm unfamiliar with, to spark my creativity or curiosity. Yeah. I think yeah. there's no recommendation and and just, you know, um, it, there is no place for curiosity, for being curious, for discovering something. Everything yeah. is convenient, everything is brought to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People get lazy. And so they, we used too much data, you think? We used too much yeah, data. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> on the one uh. hand, but on the other hand, I know a lot of lots of data is needed, except personal yeah. data. Yeah, the thing is, yeah, I mean, the question is, first of all, have we taken data too far? That's a good question. Perhaps we're using too much of it, not because, you know, in the sense of, oh, you didn't need personal data for this, but because perhaps we are assuming that everything will be better if it's data driven. And now we realize that data is not so magical that we've idolized data. That could be the case. I still think we clearly do see the benefits of machine learning these days from many things of, oh, yeah. you know, of, of, of AI and we, we do see the benefits. It's, you know, many things are improving thanks to that. We can see that like automatic translations, you know, blind people being able to read lips with these new glasses and, you know, uh, medicine, new, you know, products and services that could have never seen the light. You know, all of these tools for creators. I can see the benefits. The question is, there's no end as to how much data you could be gathering to improve a service, to train an, a machine learning algorithm. Mm -hmm. There's no limit. The question is, should the limit be what you can envisage today? So if today you know what you want to do, and it doesn't have to be legitimate interest, you know, it could just simply be what's the purpose. So more than the debate about the balance with, you know, the individual's, you know, um, rights and freedoms, the idea is if what you want to do is design, I see play people running here, like new running shoes, right? That perform better by measuring, right? Yeah. that perform last longer by measuring the way everyone who's wearing them, you know, is running and how long they run and whatever. If you collect data points from all of the runners in this park, what is the limit? Well, the limit is you just wanted to improve, you know, the shoes the in shoe? terms of how long they last. Do you need to record location for that? Perhaps not. No. Do you need to record? You need to know what uh, grounds they were running, like what soil they were running on, yeah. or was it concrete or was it just, you know, plain earth or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But you don't need to know where they were running. Maybe no, you, you don't. need to know about the temperature. Very no. cool. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Let's take a seat there. For yeah, yeah. And, and look at the beautiful city wakening up. Well, maybe it has gone up already. Yes, it has, yeah. Oh, London, I think that's really good. Shall we take another one? That yeah, that's drier, yeah. Memory of David Robach, architect. 30th September 1946 to 1985. Uh, yeah. It's a good thing. It's a beautiful thing. I had to dedicate a bench. Yes, uh, there, were, there are lots of benches here. I saw one the other day. Hello. Hello. Do you want to sit on the bench too? Huh? Yeah. That's nice. Um, it measure itself. Um, there was another bench uh, 
uh, down by the pond somewhere that had um, in memory of I forgot the name of someone someone really nice apparently um, to for the use of all for the benefit of all uh, ah. so this bench was there for everybody oh that's yeah. very cool <laughs> no but ah uh, what a beautiful way to start the day yes a walk yeah in the cold yeah wonderful I feel fresh and vigorated and <laughs> yes. so inspired with so many new ideas yeah very good <laughs> yeah we may need to do a few more tours absolutely yes i'm in <sighs> yeah yeah definitely this is a topic we can talk about forever and it's yeah. not gonna end and, but it's evolving and things are happening yeah i think people are claiming their rights are demanding more rights and, and more information and the government and, and the EU is acting on it trying to to make safeguard people better so they can move around in the internet more safety or more more protection better protection yeah or at least this is my hope I'm very optimistic <laughs> yeah I'm, I only hope I'm very optimistic about the prospects I think people are by nature you know sort of waking up to the fact that you need to be careful with data as consumers I think we are getting better as businesses everybody's becoming much more ethical I really think that it's a natural flow I don't think we need you know plenty of you know, others sort of slapping on our wrists I think people really by nature want to do the right thing Miko, I might be the missing person. Hello, you are the missing person, yeah. So I think I got the timing wrong. <laughs> All right, how are you? Yes. Hi. Oh, Sergio, nice to meet you. Hi, hi, Miko. How, how are you? you? Pleasure, I'm brother. brother, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, I was thinking like, uh, is Anher here or not? But <laughs> All right, he was here for a while, yeah. yeah.